Uh, around the, the time of the uh, recent US election, we in our house, or at least Nora and myself, started to watch some episodes of the, the West Wing on television again. And just in case you're not aware of what that program was, it's about uh, 15 or, or 20 years old, I guess, from the time it was first made. But it's about all the happenings, the, the day-to-day activities of what would supposedly happen in the, the White House. Uh, just last week, I was watching an, an episode where they were needing to appoint a new vice president. Now, because of some political maneuverings of what had been happening, it's fair to say that the best candidates were not in the frame and was not finally chosen. And so the speechwriters were really struggling with appropriate words which might begin to give a sense of excitement to those who were hearing when this announcement was finally being made. But they were struggling. However, in joke, they came up with something a lot easier when they were thinking just how bad and how mediocre this candidate really was. So whenever they were describing him, it went a bit like this. In a triumph of the middling, a nod to mediocrity, and with great gorge rising, it gives me great nausea to announce Robert Russell, Bingo Bob himself, as your new vice president. This lapdog of the mining interest is as dull as he is unremarkable as lackluster as he is soporific. This revision to the mean, this rebuke to the exemplary, gives hope to the millions unfavoured by the exceptional. Not the worst, not the best, just what we're stuck with. Now, if I begin to get you to maybe take a bit of a jump in your thinking from that, and thinking about something boring, something about mediocre. Have you ever begun to maybe to think at times that our church experience can be just a little bit like that? Ever had a conversation with someone about that? Just before this present lockdown, I had to get a new battery in my watch and I took it into a guy. And then we got chatting. I was asking him about his business and he was asking me what I did. So we were talking a little bit about church, and then he said a little bit sheepishly and a wee bit shy, I don't go very often anymore because um, it is a bit boring. And sometimes I wonder if that boring description might be well applied to, well, not even our current experience of church, but actually what we would routinely experience. And if that's the impression that we are giving because we are a little bit boring ourselves and we're bored in what we do, and we have to be honest, I think, at times and confess that this world of ours will never be reached by a people who are described or can be described as boring or mediocre. Mediocrity will never ever reach people's lives in that sense. But it's into that situation that I believe the passage that we've read this morning explodes with a huge amount of spiritual energy. Now, I think it is helpful to understand these verses a little bit if we're able to know a little bit more about the background. Joel was living through a time of uh, upheaval in in the land. Uh, And even though we know nothing of the the, um, deprivations of wartime, I think what we are experiencing at the minute gives us a little bit of insight into what Joel was experiencing. It allows us to see a little bit more the uncertainty, a little bit more of the confusion that people who were going through what Joel was going through were experiencing. Now, the exact 
occasion for, for this difficulties in Jewel's day was that a huge swarm of locusts had entered into the land and they had devoured all the food. And then immediately that was followed by a period of drought. Now, as Jewel reports all of that, and that's what he does in his, in his book here, Joel is doing something very differently from what the likes of the BBC or our journalists are doing at the minute. Because as we think of what it is that they are doing is that they are giving us a daily diet of the happenings and the events of each day. And so we're used to these uh, screenshots that come as part of the news, little bits, little statistics. And we can, to some degree, become addicted to seeing these things. We want to see the news. We want to see how it differs today from what was happening yesterday. And then listening to journalists, we know that they have their own sort of spin on that and they're portraying that, even though they're not particularly drawing any attention to that. But they're trying to say something about what's gone wrong and how it should be fixed and what is wrong with our world. But Jewel still does something different than just giving a commentary on the news or the events of his day. And what Jewel actually does is that Jewel brings God's word to bear upon this situation. And Jewel, if you understand what's going on here, is that he's evidently sensitive to what's been happening to the nation of Israel. He's aware of the pain of what they're having to live through. He's aware of the difficulties and and the deprivations. But he also gives them hope. And he also tells them this swarm of locusts, it's going to disappear. It will go. And even beyond that, he's, he's giving them even greater hope because he's looking forward to a day when God's grace will will come in an even fuller and a more wonderful demonstration, a day that he describes as the last day or the day of the Lord. But as we think about it, what Joel is doing in this section of the Bible is the way that God's Word so often works in our hearts and lives. Because we find, and I'm sure you find this in your own situation, when you've been going through a time of difficulty and and you're really struggling at the moment, when you are reading God's Word, you will find, I trust, that God's Word is able to speak to you right where you are. It speaks into your situation and God ministers by His Holy Spirit into your life in those moments but he also is able to make you look ahead, to look ahead to a day of hope, a day that is much better and a day that is much greater, a day that is still yet to come. And that is exactly what Joel is doing in this passage. So perhaps just now I want to look in more detail at these few verses. And maybe my first point, and it's the first move the slide can be shown up, and what the focus that is coming out of verses 28 and verse 29, and it is simply this, I will pour out my spirit. That's what God is saying. I mean, let's read verse 28 and 29. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I want you, again, just to really focus in on what God is saying with that line, I will pour out my spirit. And as we we look in, in even more tiny, microscopic detail, as it were, in that sense, to draw out even a little bit more. And the focus on that, on two words, which is simply, I will pour out, pour out my spirit. I've already been saying what I've been thinking about today, that the main metaphor of what's been going on here is that it's this picture of dry, arid land and this pouring out of rain. That's the image. And what it's giving is this sense of wonderful blessing that God is able to, to, to bring. It's just this, this, the size, the scale, it's vast, it's huge. It's extravagant. But what Joel 
is trying to get at, what God's word is trying to get at, even, even with the, the thought of the experience of all of this, it comes down to this is what it is to know and experience God, to really know God as he pours out his spirit upon us. And Jeremiah says something very similar to that, the hope that they're all looking forward to, the day when, when we will all fully know and experience God. Jeremiah 31, verse 34, where Jeremiah prophesies, they will no longer teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. Now, that's what's coming out from just those couple words, pour out. But as you still just look at that first line in verse 28 about pouring out, what is being poured out? But it is my spirit. And as we think what we might learn from that, it's simply a reminder that this gift, this gift that God is promising to give, his spirit, is the greatest and is the best possible thing that he can ever give. There is nothing that meets this. There is nothing that matches this. This is my spirit, God's spirit, he's saying. And Jesus is saying something very similar to that in Luke's gospel, Luke 11 where Jesus says, which of you, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, when Jesus is describing that, and when Jesus is speaking there, and when he describes this gift of the Holy Spirit to his people, Jesus doesn't try to explain why he thinks this is the best gift that could ever be given. He simply states it because he knows that it is the best gift that can ever be given to anyone. And then when we think about that, and when we think what we might be asking for in prayer, because right now we might be thinking, I would, I don't know, I'd rather have a new job, I would rather have a new car, I would rather have a new body, what, whatever it is that we're thinking, this is my priority in prayer. When our values are not matched up with Jesus' values, because Jesus' value says the best thing that you can ask for, the best thing that you can have is the very Spirit of God. And as we continue on, just looking at verse 28 and, and that little phrase, I will pour out my spirit. And then it's, we read, upon all flesh. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And as we read that little word flesh, it's a reminder of really who we are, that we are flesh and bones, and it's also a reminder that we are weak and that we are frail and that we feel. And even though we will gladly accept whatever the government can give to us to make us better or to get us through this time, we still remind ourselves that we are weak people in need of help. But it is here exactly that the Spirit of God meets us and he offers us true life because we need hope beyond this life. We need hope beyond death itself because this is what we were made for. This is what you were made for because you were made to enjoy eternal life. And this is the very thing that your heart cries out for because you need this salvation that Jesus Christ has made possible for you. But as we read this phrase about, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, the focus is surely even upon the fact that it's all of us. 
every one of us, all ages, all sexes, all station of life. And that was something that Moses also yearned for. Numbers 11, verse 29. I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. So this is a, a new spirituality. It's not centered on just a few people, but it's everyone. A place where everyone is empowered to speak the Lord's word and to be able to bring God's word to other people. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now, this image of reviving power of the Spirit of God, it's welcome, it's encouraging. But not everything in this passage is straightforward or easy. Because as we move on, and maybe my second main point, maybe the slide will be able to show it. It's saying, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh and I will show wonders. Let's read verse 30 and 31. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. You know, life is hard at the minute. But we also can't forget that actually we have a lot to be thankful for. We do have so much that makes life relatively comfortable. And because of that, we can get very comfortable in this world in which we live. So even though today we may fully know in our heads that heaven is our final destiny. It's the place where we, where we want to go. There's also a sense that we're relatively happy where we are to the extent that C.S. Lewis described earth and our life on earth as a merry little inn on the journey. So sometimes actually we need verses like this as we've been reading today, unsettling verses that remind us this world is not our final destiny. This world is not our final home because ultimately a day is coming when, when God will upset everything and our familiar routines and all that we have been enjoying each and every day and he will break into those pleasant surroundings with a degree of upheaval and God will disrupt normal life with the reminder of the power of his presence. Quite a while ago, we were reading in the book of Habakkuk and Habakkuk says something very similar. Habakkuk 1 verse 5. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. And this is what God says, I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. And so as we read that, it's like God is saying to us that he's going to perform some unsettling actions. He's going to bring certain things into our experience, certain things that we just don't understand, things that we can't understand, things that even if we were told that they were going to happen, we wouldn't quite believe. And possibly even now we are living through a situation just like that. And what's the point of these unsettling moments and these unsettling situations that we go through? These things that come right out of left field to us. Is there a purpose? Well, of course there is. And that purpose is to remind us that this world is not our home, but that they are pointers to that final destiny. And it's God reminding us that another day is coming. And a day is coming that will be described as the day of the Lord. 
and that everything that we experience in this life, everything that is unsettling and is not as we would normally have it, it is pointing us forward to that day of Jesus. And so these events that we live through and all that we are enduring, what should we be learning? What's it encouraging us to do? If you read down to the very last verse that we read in verse 32, 32 says, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. See, as the Spirit of God falls and he enters into our lives, what the Spirit of God does is that the Spirit shows us Jesus. And he reveals and makes clear to us why it is that we really need Jesus. And he shows us what Jesus has done for us. He shows us the significance of what Jesus did on the cross and he makes it real and he makes it meaningful and he helps us to understand so that we can really take it in, so that we see that what Jesus did on the cross was the answer to all the dysfunction and all that is wrong within my life and all that I see that is personal to me. The Spirit makes clear clear that I need Jesus. And as I read these verses today, and as you hear these verses today, perhaps you need to remind yourself is that, yes, I need to make sure that I am part of this wonderful family of God's people, that I have made Jesus my own, and that I am accepting this forgiveness that Jesus has offered, this salvation is mine, and I know that today. But you know, there's another question that I have in this passage. And the question is simply this. These things that Joel has been writing about, this day of the Lord, when the Spirit falls in an unusual way, has that already happened? If I remind you of the or what is written in the opening chapter of the book of Acts. As Jesus was reminding his people that ahead of time that they would have a special gift, and that special gift would be the Holy Spirit, and that the disciples, the ones who were following Jesus, would be what he describes as being baptized with the Holy Spirit. He promised that they would be empowered by the Holy Spirit and that they would go and that they would be witnesses to Jesus in the world. And then on the day of Pentecost, as the disciples were gathered in the upper room, the Spirit of God fell upon them and what is described as tongues of fire were upon each of their heads. And they were so amazed at what had happened as they left that room and they went out into the crowd who were gathered all around them. They began to speak in all the different languages, languages that they had never known. And people were amazed at what had happened because they heard people speaking in languages that they could hear and that they could understand. And it was such a, a strange event that they assumed that these people must be drunk. And then, Acts chapter 2, Peter gets up to speak. And what Peter says at the beginning, he says, men and women, these guys are not drunk. It's not even noon. And then Peter goes back to Joel chapter 2, the passage we have read this morning. And what Peter says is this, this pouring out of my spirit upon all flesh. This has been fulfilled today. And you were here and you saw it and you witnessed it. And then in the, the rest of the book of Acts, it's described that actually this is just but the beginning because God's people have now been empowered by the Spirit of God to go out into the world to be witnesses for Jesus. And we today are still part of that. We are living in what Peter later describes as living in the last days. And we are waiting for this final return of Jesus Christ. But as Joel begins 
this passage describing drought. There's also that image of spiritual depression in the midst of it. And as we apply that to ourselves, I wonder at times, what's the condition of your own heart? Can your heart be as hard as rock? Are you in need of a special measure of the Spirit of God? This Spirit of God who brings life and energy and color into your life. How can a church ever be described as boring or mediocre when the Spirit of God is truly in the midst of them and empowering God's people to live as servants of Jesus? And it's a travesty that this world of ours might be able to describe the church as boring or mediocre mediocre because of how we have lived. When we have been slow to believe in Jesus, when we have been slow to step out in faith and ask God to bless our prayers. So this world that's all around us should be able to see us praying and praying confidently, believing in God, and not only seeing us praying, but also seeing the answers to our prayers as we pray. Because our dependence upon God will be complete. We will certainly not be relying upon ourselves and our abilities to get us through these things and how we can somehow manage to achieve or do anything. But let us, as a people of God, be surprised by God, continuing to be surprised by what God brings to pass in our midst, recognizing that God just will work as he pleases, and he will work in people's hearts and lives, sometimes in the very last people that we might begin to imagine. So I simply invite you today to try praying, to try praying and seeing what God will do among us. As we quit looking at ourselves or trusting in ourselves or assuming we might have strength to get us through, but that we solely look to Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, give us grace. Grant us strength. But above all, grant us a reliance upon your Spirit. And we do long for that day, Lord, when your Spirit would come afresh upon us. Show us, Jesus. Reveal your Spirit to us. Amen.